In the prologue to your book, you mentioned that before the series, before you began the series, that you were in your early 30s and that you were struck with a debilitating illness of some kind. Could you describe a little bit of what that illness was? I think if we look at the individual psyche and the potential in the individual psyche, that if that, if that individuation doesn't have a chance to find some authentic expression, that to try to fit in to just the conventional demands of life certainly would fit in with the observation of, or not the observation, but the recognition of deadly conventionality. That, that this almost as if the psyche, the psychic potential that doesn't get a chance to be expressed will turn against the individual, not only in a psychological way, but affect the physical body. And I, some individuals are more prone to that vulnerability than others. And I was particularly prone. I think from birth, uh, I was sickly. I'd never fit into the environment of the family in which I was born. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't until um, until that avenue was opened up for expression through the paintings primarily that uh, the healthy potential had a chance to live. So what was it that was physically pro uh, troubling you in your early 30s? Even though at that time I don't think I would have recognized it as to what today might be uh, diagnosed as a depression, there was a continual exhaustion, a physical weakness, and terrible headaches. And uh, uh, and the, the, when I did seek medical help, they would say, well, maybe a brain tumor, or uh, maybe this is multiple sclerosis. And I'd have to say, at that time, that with the desperate, de not knowing, or uh, I think a diagnosis would have been welcome. That, uh, that some, what a relief it would be if one would, you at least knew what was wrong. So but, what, what but, was your day like? Would you, did you have trouble getting out of bed or? Oh, or just... I would have day after day where I was not able to get out of bed. And then of course, on the days that I could, uh, so much had piled up as far as the care of children and kind of keeping the house running and all that uh, you soon used up what little juice you had <laughs> uh -huh. and then there'd be back in those days of just being sort of immobilized. Yeah. Did they give you and any 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 uh, hope of any uh, treatment, a plan of any kind? or Well, I, I'm so grateful to my husband, uh, who was a medical doctor. And when we went to the neurologist, the neurologist said, let's try shock treatments. Whoa. <laughs> and my husband said, no. I shudder to think what would have happened if he had followed just a conventional adaptation to the medical approach at that time. But he sort of struggled along with me and 
um, supported supported what I needed to do and, and and it was because of that illness then that I you know I did decide that I would go to Zurich. So at the time you were pursuing a diagnosis to what you're going through physically, were you also de dealing with any with a therapist at this oh, time? Oh, indeed, I was. I was working in depth psychology, and in retrospect, I see the value of that therapy at that time, of how supportive that was, to support me in developing a stronger ego position. Because without that ego position, there would be no way to process the, this archetypal material that later came up in the dreams. And because I was so close uh, to that inner, to the reality of that inner world, I suppose when I first went into therapy, it would be a valid, uh, it would be a valid uh, diagnosis to say that I was a um, borderline personality. But you know, in retrospect, I think any of us that uh, that have that acute sensibility to the inner reality of the li of of the psyche would in a non pejorative way have to operate on that borderline because it's the reality of the inner world that has to be balanced with the outer world and you're on the edge of a knife I worked with Max Seller, who was a Jungian analyst, uh, and then went to James Kirsch, who was a Jungian analyst, and to Hilda Kirsch. And the real value of having fallen into that uh, approach to the psychic suffering or the neurotic suffering would be they honored the struggle so that they, in a sense, provided a container for that uh, ego development or that uh, gradual strengthening of the ego position that would be strong enough to, um, in a way, hold the tension between the opposites of both that irrational inner reality and the rationality and the conventionality of the outer reality. When I first encountered Jung's approach to the psyche. I think it was, uh, it was like water in the desert. It was the first thing that ever made sense to my life. Uh, and before that there was a kind of dutiful, hopelessness of, or meaninglessness. I think that would be the big change, that, uh, that the, to be exposed to the symbolic life resonated so with my own particular psyche that um, uh, it was very exciting. It resonated with the reality of the inner world. So before we, you went to Zurich, you had a particular dream that was very, very, mind, very mm -hmm. important to you. Can you tell us something about the dream? 
It was such a simple dream. And the dream pretty much said the cause of the illness, which had been undiagnosed and, you know, left a mystery. And it was the cause of the dream is that the threshold is so low. And I had had enough therapy and was acquainted enough to what, how the dreams worked that it was the endorsement of, yes, the illness is that the unconscious comes in so strongly, that there is not an ego threshold to keep out the archetypal material. And if you don't have a way to process that, it can be overwhelming. I think I was, I think I was, by personality, may not even have changed that much. Uh, by nature, would be uh, much, much more centered in the inner world than the outer world. In fact, uh, when I was in Switzerland, I worked with uh, Dr. Liliane Fry, and her comment was, you are so introverted that it is almost as if the reality, your reality is that of the inner world, not of the outer world, which will not make it particularly easy in dealing with the conventional expectations that one encounters. Have you been exposed to Christianity in your early years? <laughs> uh, overtly, no. Um, I think from the uh, In the early years, the, the reality of my father's background, which was of the Dunkards, which is one of the brethren associated with the Amish. Uh, and while he was no longer actively involved with the church, the psyche is uh, infused with the values of, of uh, that conditioning. And uh, so the attitudes that I grew up with were much more limited to those uh, limitations of the agrarian, the, you know, the agrarian conformity, the place of women, the expectations of women, so that uh, as a child, any creative uh, curiosity for learning would not be necessarily in force. And, uh, and being, uh, being that introverted, of course, the conventional educational system was difficult. Uh, and I didn't do that well, but I yearned for an education. So when I finished high school and decided and eventually decided that I wanted a college education, the attitude of the family was much, well, 
who does she think she is? Mm -hmm. And so there was no reinforcement in that regard. So that the potential, the feminine potential, I think of a uh, sort of archetypal orientation to that patriarchal culture of the brethren uh, didn't have much of a chance. And then later on, uh, when we came to California as children, my father had become a Christian scientist. And that was really, I think, for me as a woman, you know, this thing that the body would be so negated, <laughs> so negated, that, that made it doubly difficult. So, uh, I was a pretty battered soul by the time, <laughs> by the time I hit By the time I hit Max Seller, when but I was such a, I was so fortunate to have married. If I had to follow conventional containment because I didn't have anything else, I was so fortunate to have a, a husband that was also searching. So you were, it sounds like you were pretty much on your own, but when you were growing up, was there anything in particular that you could feel as though you could really identify with? Well, it was interesting. Uh, as I was growing up with my sisters, who were, I was the run of the litter, and a sickly child, and... Uh, and I think my first set of teeth had been so rotten, and they'd say, "Ah, oh, you know, she's a witch." <laughs> and uh, so that the fantasy there would have been four of us. I had three sisters, and at that time, the story of the little, the little women. Is that the title of it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Little Women. Mm -hmm. well, the, the, the sisters sort of identified with that and they said, you know, Katie will be Beth. <laughs> and I thought, you know, Beth has to die pretty young. <laughs> so it was that role of being the sickly one mm -hmm. that was sort of the imposed projection onto me that uh, it took me some time to rebel against that. Mm -hmm. And uh, So that was an identity that was imposed upon you? And well, it was sort of the, the role I was given within the, you know, the context of Poor, struggling young girls, you know. <laughs> well, that's how the family defined you, but was there maybe anything that you, how you defined yourself inwardly that made sense? A kind of desperation. Was there any character in literature that you could identify with? No, or not that I could remember. Any, any, any models that you had, maybe, in, in, in the community? Uh, yes, there was one, there was the mother of a, um, uh, of a young girl that I went to school with in grammar school. And she, she became uh, 
But she sort of took me in, and I think what little socializing I got growing up, I probably got from her, her bringing me in and including me and trying to help me along. And I do know that when I finally, I dropped out of high school because I thought, I just don't know what I'm doing here. And uh, she went down to the high school and just raised hell. And she said, have you seen the IQ of this woman, of this girl? And I'd never seen the IQ. I didn't even know what an IQ was, really. And uh, she held in there with me when I was just lost. I would say mostly I felt lost when I met my husband Sandy. She's uh, and he was a medical student and at that time was uh, preparing for his license for his medical license. And she said, "I know, I know one of the men that's down there, and I'm going to find out about this man." And so it was she who said, now Katie, he's a really good man. He's a good man. You do well to marry Sandy. And I wasn't, I was so lost, I wasn't ready to do much of anything except, but I thought, well, you know, she's a very bright woman, and if she says, I better marry him. Well, maybe I'll marry him. And I have to say, it was a very productive marriage that lasted for 65 years. And, uh, but, but she, she, she was, she was the outstanding woman, I think, as a feminine figure in my life, she was not a pretentious woman. That she was, her husband was very successful, but she was a genuine human being. So, where was your mother in this in this early in these early years for you? Well, my mother died when I was seven. But uh, previous to that, as I mentioned, I was sort of the run of the family. Uh, and my heart, in retrospect, my heart goes out to that woman as she had uh, first birth was a boy that died the first day. This second birth were twins, where the girl survived and the boy died the first day. Then she had another girl, which survived. And then along I come, another girl, and a sickly girl. And, uh, then she has another boy that dies the first day. Then she has another girl. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and my understanding, which I only learned uh, later in life, I always thought she died of the flu, but I was told uh, by an older cousin that she died from complications of childbirth. And uh, my mother, while she was uh, overtly a cheerful woman, she didn't like me. So even my experience of my mother while she was living was not a nurturing, I 
don't remember nurturing from her at all. And uh, then with that kind of negative background, I was left with a, a kind of archetypal image of a more of a witch mother. And oh, I think to this day, I find it very difficult to, you know, to accept, uh, to trust warmth. The, the years that I spent with Mrs. Ducker, the woman that I told you was, that surrogate mother was, was helpful. Kind of helpful in getting me on my feet. And, uh, and then the other great, I would say, great mother influence, which may sound strange because it's an irrational sort of mothering, would be the experience with the Hopi Indians. And uh, particularly with a woman that was about my age that was so connected to the, that kind of earthiness and that authenticity of her femininity in a very unconscious way and um, to the religious connection to that more holistic uh, ceremonial life that we were so fortunate to begin to share in. So what were the circumstances surrounding uh, your mother's passing? Well, of course, there was no preparation for it. Uh, I think the first I knew of it was that sort of uh, almost an anticipatory experience of being with the children up by the school because we lived in the country. We were in Wisconsin, northern Wisconsin. And um, I was seven years old, and the kids were all playing on the bridge, and I'd, they'd said, stay off that bridge. It was just an old bridge. But uh, I was there anyway, and uh, this boy fell in the water, and he grabbed a hold of me pulled me under and they fished him out when I sank to the bottom and it's a strange thing to have a memory like that but it was so clear that if I needed to save myself that I'd just sort of crawl along the bottom of that stream and grab a hold of the little reeds and things and pull myself up and I thought oh, Boy, I'm going to get hell when I get home. And, and it was about a mile home, and I trudged home, and, and there just was nobody there. And uh, then later, someone came in and said, well, you know, your mother's in the hospital. And so that, uh, that night, uh, my father took us to say goodbye. And it was a Catholic hospital, and it's one of the things that spooked me for years because the nurses at that time wore the black habits. And it would, it, they would be like, I don't think they black. Birds of prey, in a way swooping up and down the halls. And my father took me in and said, now, your mother wants to say goodbye to, to all of you. And uh, there was this 
desperate feeling. I want to go with her. If I could crawl in, if I could only go with her. And, uh, uh, of course, you couldn't. And you could see that her, that her hands and all were turning blue. And she knew she was dying. And she said, now girls, I want you to obey your father. Whatever, you know, whatever you ask him. And when I look at that in retrospect, I think, yes, that spent years of obeying that voice in my head, that masculine voice in my head, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. And uh, I know, I know that that's a problem for almost any woman growing up in a patriarchal society, but uh, I could certainly see the reinforcement that there was in that hospital room. Partly because of my temperament and, and that early exposure to death and the, uh, the kind of aftermath that there was of that experience where we were taken to the, taken to the funeral and they hold us up and there she is in the, in the coffin. Then they had another funeral at the place where she was buried. We were taken there. There she is. And in a way, that has made me so familiar with death. And, uh, and in a very strange way, my practice, I've had much more than my share of clients facing death. But it also, I think, reinforced the pull to the other side of life, which you don't think of that so much as introversion, but introversion uh, or the psyche sees death as a part of life in a way that our culture doesn't endorse at all. And uh, so that, uh, that was a power, a very powerful experience and I thought afterwards that that afternoon of that experience of having to pull myself from under the water is much what I've done the rest of my life through my paintings. Each one would be grabbing a hold of a, some reality in the unconscious to pull myself to the surface. And uh, it's only been the last 10 years, I would say, that I feel that I have functioned anywhere near effectively in the collective society. But I take no credit for that because society has changed to where it will accept the reality of the unconscious in a way that never, never would have in the early parts of my life or the early parts of my therapy. You didn't talk about these things because there was no honoring of the, how real the psyche is. It was a sort of a a despair, you know, if psychology wasn't working or what I was getting in Los Angeles 
wasn't working and the medical profession brought no help and I thought I have to make sense of my life before I die because I, I didn't have much hope for life. So it, that first trip was really for trying to make some sense of my life. And who did you meet when you were there? And I went to work with Le, uh, Dr. L Lillian Fry and uh, James Kirsch was there at the same time. I tried to work with, um, what is his name, uh, Fred Meyer, Dr. Meyer, and uh, I had one session with him and went back to the pension and I was just ill. I felt squashed and I thought I, there's no way I could work with that man. And uh, so I worked with James Kirsch and with Lillian Fry because at that time, if you could go to Zurich, you just immersed yourself in your own process. And uh, which entailed working with two analysts in one week, which is an interesting process because you could take material to one person and you'd think, oh, I get the idea. And then you'd take the dream to the other person and they're seeing it from a different point of view and you think, wait a minute, you know, <laughs> this isn't what I thought it was. But it certainly rounded out, it rounded out the material. And aside from the, your, the work that you'd have to do for those two appointments, they had lectures every morning. So there would be Dr. von Franz and, and um, Barbara Hanna and Dr. Fertz and um, Jung was no longer lecturing then. That was 1955. It was a really interesting place with very interesting people. Very different people. They were from all over. And uh, uh, and some of the old timers, you know, they they met in this old building on Gemeindestrasse. It's now in Kusna, but at that time it was in Zurich, it, on Gemeindestrasse. And they had this big old building. And when you went in, it was like you could smell apples were down in the cellar. <laughs> so it's kind of a homey place. And then they had a big old room, one of these rooms there set up as a lecture room, and they had, oh, multiple chairs like you'd have from a house, you know, the somewhere were stuffed chairs and some regular chairs and all. And some of the old timers pretty much had their place figured out. And then when some of us new timers came in and took their place, you know, they were mean about it, but you soon, soon learned that you kind of picked up the idea that that wasn't your place. <laughs> but mostly it was interesting. And it was 
human. Did, did you feel like you were getting physically better being there? I felt at home. I felt at home and and yes, because you know, I suppose if you were anemic and had a blood pressure transfusion, you'd feel better. But this was such a wonderful transfusion of just being immersed in a psychic reality. Because my work came from such a deep level, uh, uh, Lillian Fry got in touch with Jung and said, you know, I think you'd do well to see Katie Sanford because he wasn't seeing people at that time. And I mean, he would see people, but he wasn't seeing people just regularly. Because somewhere she's going to fit in with your idea of flying saucers, <laughs> which is, would be the idea, you know, that there was the projection of the self into the into the sky and that there would be this experience of the reality of the psyche within flying saucers. So, uh, and in those days, if you if you did have an appointment with James Kirsch, you'd I, I mean with Dr. Pra, uh, Dr. Jung, you didn't talk about it to anybody because of course everybody would like to have had an experience with Dr. Jung. So I caught the train to Kusnacht and walked up to the house, and I'm thinking he's going to have the answer to my life. Finally, I'll get the answer to my life. And I walk in, and here's this big man in a flannel shirt, and, well, you know, hello, what do you bring, and so on and so forth. I think, this isn't what I expected, you know. I thought hey, somebody pat me on the head, you know, and said, blessed, blessed. But no way, he was so challenging and so human. And I ended up pretty confused. And he got up when the hour was over and he said, well, you know, I, I really wish you good luck. And he puts his arm around me and walks me to the door. I went away and I thought, what happened? Not at all what I thought was going to happen. But eventually I thought there was a genuine human being that met you as a human being. And how unusual that is. We meet each other with the persona, but seldom do we meet each other as a real human being to another human being. Being responsible for your own humanity, both the shadow and the light. That is beautiful. And that, that I think, is sometimes lost in the kind of glorification or deification of being a Jungian as to what tremendous work it is to carry your own humanity. So, so what did he tell you? 
I, I learned a lot because he just looked at me as a human being and saw the limitations of my being so off the ground. And one of the ways he did it was we were in his library, which was a fantastic place, you know, with books and different artifacts around, and, and we just sat across each other with a table, sort of like this, and he said to me, Katie, you see that Buddha on that table? Pick it up. And I thought, I'm not going to handle your stuff. <laughs> so I just sit there, and he got so impatient, and he said, pick it up. So I reached over to pick it up. I couldn't believe how heavy it was. I could hardly lift it off the table. And he said, now you see, it may not be polite for you, but when you go through life, you have to try things out because otherwise you won't know what the reality of it is. So I take it a lot of really wonderful things happened for you when you were in Zurich, but when you came home, you were still facing this illness. Is that right? But I faced it differently. It was... There had been enough established that there was another world besides that conventional world in which I had been conditioned. And, of course, my husband's family had been conditioned as well. Everybody was conditioned, pretty much. And, um, yeah. So there was always that door <clears throat> that had been opened that sort of brought in the challenge of how, how do you bring this into that life? 